Can Jason Anderson win the 2022 Monster Energy Supercross Championship? Is Ken Roxon's career over? And what team do you think Christian Craig's going to end up when he goes to 450s inevitably after he wins his championship? Oh, and one more big question. Is Chad Reed going to go down as the best Aussie to ever come to America? Let's find out in today's post-race Supercross show on your Sunday grind. I'm Derek Harris here at HP Race Development, and i got a great show coming right at you right now. Let's get started. Got my trusty coffee here, and we're going to talk about Anaheim 3 2022 AMA Pro Supercross Racing. I don't even know if it's AMA anymore, to be honest with you guys. Feld Entertainment owns it. AMA's involved. Who knows? I do know FIM no longer on board. Who cares? Right? So let's move on. What an awesome night of racing. Drop a comment below what you guys thought of our awesome racing at Anaheim 3. If you're not into pro racing, this isn't the show for you. I was on the edge of my seat that entire 450 main event. It was incredible. Watching Jason Anderson get that early lead was what I've been waiting for this year. I feel like personally that Jason Anderson has been the best rider on track at every single race. At Anaheim 1, he moved up through the pack, had a great race going, and then he got Barsha. He got Bam Bam. To be honest with you, I think he owes one to Barsha, but the reality is that Barsha's not even in his league right now, and I don't know if Anderson's going to get that opportunity to pay that back. And I don't think he wants to. He's got the title at hand. He's going to continue to go for that title. I think that Barsha is what Barsha has been for a long time. Barsha is a consistent three to five place guy. He's really good at it. He doesn't crash very often. He's a pretty good starter in general, and he seems to be capable of continuing to put the bike in the three to five range. I don't think we're going to see Barsha rattle off a win this year. I just don't see the speed being there for him to do it. Tomac was incredible last night again. He's clearly incredibly comfortable this year. He's clearly really fast this year. We've never questioned his fitness. I don't even know if he's the most fit he's ever been, but he's never not been fit, never been a problem for him. Let's talk about Tomac's bike. And this is something that I really wanted to touch on on this show is what we see with the bikes and then maybe some insights to you guys that will help you guys in your testing. So when you go buy a bike and it says set the sag between this range or you go listen to the magazine outlets and they say set the sag between this range and set your fork height to this range, yada, 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 yada. That goes completely out the window for these Supercross teams. These teams might sometimes end up in those windows, but oftentimes they're going to be outside of these windows because those bikes are totally different than anything anybody rides that you go buy. So right now that Kawasaki, to me, is looking like the best bike in pro racing. That doesn't mean it's the best bike off the showroom or the worst bike off the showroom. Right now that Yamaha looks incredible in pro racing doesn't mean it's the best bike off the showroom or the worst bike in pro off the showroom because you don't buy what they race. It's not even remotely the same motorcycle. Get that out of your heads, right? Now those manufacturers want you to think that, but that's just not the case. So let's talk about Tomac's bike. Tomac's bike's really tall in the rear this year. I want you to watch that next time you watch it. The difference between the tire in the air, which is fully extended, versus him going down a straightaway doesn't look like there's any difference. The bike is extended. It's really tall. A lot of people think when you hit the gas on a motorcycle, it squats. That's not entirely true. The actual forces involved make the bike extend. We can show that to you if you go watch my dyno videos on this channel. You'll see that. When we hit the gas on the dyno, the bike picks up. That has to do with the angle of the chain and the forces involved. It actually extends the bike. When a bike squats, it has to do with weight transfer and center of gravity. So if your center of gravity is really high and tall and far away from the center line of the bike and you accelerate, there's a leverage arm that's going to torque on the bike and it can potentially make the rear end squat. But if you actually watch a rear tire when the bike is on the gas, they extend, especially when they're near a uh, sag position. This is really important because it affects the chassis and handling of your motorcycle tremendously through bumps and things like that. Tomac's bike doesn't look like he's running a lot of sag to me. And his front end is probably the softest front end that I think I've ever seen in Supercross in a long time. Now, it may not be soft valving-wise, but the actual spring tension and pressure at the beginning of the stroke, to me, looks very soft. It looks like the front end, and I say very soft relative to other bikes, the front end is settling really, really well into those corners. Watch it. Watch when he comes into the corner how much those forks move. They move a lot more than some of the other manufacturers out there. To me, the Cowie looks incredibly balanced. Jason Anderson's bike, front to back, everything looks perfect. It just looks balanced. Now, I'm sure there's things he's struggling with, and I'm sure there's things the teams are always improving on, but that bike looks really good, and he is the only guy out there right now who's able to slide that rear end into corners extremely early. He's getting turned and set up 
early. Like that bike slides into the turn, and then he's on the gas, and it's helping pitch it back around. It's absolutely incredible. He was consistently gapping Eli Tomac everywhere on the track, with the exception of the whoops, which was the difference maker in this race. We finally had a set of whoops that was worth talking about. These whoops were separators. They were, I mean, at Oak Oakland had some serious whoops, but they weren't that big of a separator. This race had whoops that really only the top guys were capable of getting through consistently and fastly, and they still were not capable of getting through them consistently. Think about it. The race damn near came down to the difference between Eli Tomac or Anderson making it through the whoops a couple laps. Anderson screwed up a couple times, managed to save it, and then it turns out that Eli screwed up a couple times, lost a little bit of confidence, which he said on the podium, and it really cost him the race because otherwise they were pretty much cat and mouse. Awesome, awesome race this year. Really excited for it. I'm personally on the train that Anderson is the best rider on the track this entire season. That's my personal take. Uh, obviously, he's been some rough luck with his motorcycle at Oakland. He got taken out the first round. Um, and I think there's been a couple other things where his starts haven't been there. But I do think his actual on-track riding has been the best. So I'm going to say that this was a pivotal moment in this season. I'm saying it today. If there was going to be hope for this championship, to not go to Eli Tomac, it had to happen tonight. Anderson pulled off that win and gave the entire sport something to talk about for the next couple weeks because I think that that was a confidence booster for him. I think that it's going to help propel him to continue to work hard because he's now like, I can do this. He's got two race wins. He's looking great. And I think that it confirmed to him that he's been the best rider on the track and that finally he was able to put it all together. So this was a pivotal race in my opinion, and we have to – not overlook it for the entire title picture. Now let's talk more about the bike on the KTM's Husqvarna's Gas Gas. Now the new generation bikes, and I haven't watched Barsha's bike that much. Sadly, he hasn't had much TV time, even though he's done really well. And I think he's a three to fifth place guy. Unfortunately, he just doesn't quite have the front pace. But if you watch the KTM group bikes, Webb, Muskin, Malcolm, to me, the front of the bike looked really stiff coming into the corners. That front end does not dive very much. It may not be valving. It could just be spring pressure, air pressure, whatever they're using. But it does not look like the front end has much pitching ability to it. It looks really, really stiff to me. And then the rear of the bikes look kind of low when they're at sag positions, when they're going down straightaways. And they're really slow. They have a very slow rebound in the rear of those bikes. If you watch the Hondas, you watch Eli's bike, you watch Anderson's bike, they extend almost the second that the bike leaves the jump face. And a lot of people, I, we were doing some testing with a kid named Caden Braswell in Florida, and the mechanic was like, Shay Seconds rebounds really slow. <laughs> it's not. It's probably the fastest rebound you could possibly imagine compared to a consumer bike. Watch those rear ends. When they leave a jump, that rear end extends almost instantly. I mean, it's really quick, especially compared to consumer bikes. And then watch it compared to the KTM's Gas Gas Husky. Those bikes extend, and then the last like four inches of wheel travel is like really slow to come out. This is interesting to me. I don't think it's the right direction for them. I think they need to go faster in that department, and I also think that they need to pick up the rear of the bikes a little bit, just as what it looks like to me. Maybe by softening the front, the rears will start to pick up. That's a balanced thing that you're always chasing on these chassis, but that's what it looks like on those bikes to me. The bikes look rigid. It looks like Webb's not able to turn that bike as quickly as he historically has been able to in those tight bull turns, and it just looks like it's stiff. Now, I'm not saying it's a chassis thing. I'm not saying that that's forks being too rigid. I'm just saying that's what it looks like to me, that they look a little stiffer in the front end. They don't settle in the front, and I think it's costing them. Marvin Muskin was able to get through those whoops better than any other KTM guys, so are we really blaming the bike for the whoops, or is it technique, or is it a confidence thing? When all those guys get together and say, hey, I don't like my bike, it's not good through the whoops, and then that pervades amongst that team, right, and that becomes the thing for that bike, all of a sudden you have an excuse. Now, I'm not saying that the bike's perfect. But I am saying that if they'd all done their own things and were separate and didn't communicate with one another, kind of like the old days, you would just be told, you just got to figure it out. S McGrath's over there. He's hitting them. Lusk is over there. He's hitting the whoops, right, on the same bike you're on, and you would just have to figure it out. And let's not forget that RC did not have a bike that was set up well for Supercross, and yet he still won championships. Set up. So let's continue a little bit on the topic of bike setup. You know, RC won titles without a perfect motorcycle, right? He just was a beast. He just got it done. Now, you can say the level of competition was down. Fair, fair assessment. I don't agree with that entirely, and we'll talk about that. But I do think that we need to realize that setup is one part of it, and if you're really comfortable, really happy, 
then of course that makes you faster. But a lot of times confidence and setup go hand in hand, meaning when you're riding well, then you like your setup and then you go do well and then you trust your setup and then you continue to ride better and do better and do well. And then when you're not riding well and you're getting your ass handed to you, then you blame the bike and then you go in circles on your motorcycle and then you're not happy with the bike and then you go in circles with the motorcycle and your results suck and then you go in circles and you're never confident. That's, I think, what has just plagued Ken Roxon almost his whole career, but additionally, not just from his career, we might be watching the very end of Ken Roxon right now. I think that's it. So if Kenny wants to continue on in this sport, somehow he's going to have to find that confidence in his motorcycle that allows him to go out and ride well, do well, get more confidence in the bike, and win again. Now, outdoors, if he decides to race, if he's healthy, he'll be good again. He's probably one of the most gifted outdoor riders we've ever seen when it comes to the ability to go fast without really trying hard. His roll speed is what I call it. His ability to go through bumps and corners without hammering them makes him incredible compared to a lot of other guys. And so because of that, I think he can ride around different setups than other people have. He can have a little bit softer outdoor setup than most people because he's not hammering the brake so hard through some of these braking zones. Some, he, he's so gifted at it. But if he can't figure this out, that's the end of his career. And why would he go race and go get 8th places and 10th places? He is the type of guy. He's the German wonder kid. They put him in a Petri dish, made that kid to go out and conquer the world in motocross and supercross. That's what I believe. I believe he's the German wonder kid. They they couldn't beat, you know, th that's what Germany has now, right? They have their ability to go out and conquer things without conquer things. And, and I'm kidding here if you're German, but he, to me, was poised to be the guy and the guy for a while. And unfortunately, those injuries really set him back. Now, I think a little bit of his lack of confidence in his motorcycle over the last few years is really setting him back. This could be the end. Let's move on to getting your ass beat by 30 seconds. So we'd say our sport's competitive, more competitive than ever. And it's true in qualifying time. We see that from 1st to 20th in the 450s is, I think, 2 seconds. I didn't look it up, but it's been around 2 seconds all season. 1st to 10th could be 1 second oftentimes unless somebody rattles off an amazing fast lap, like if one guy just breaks one out. But it's really tight. But when it comes to the main events, I don't think we've seen anything remotely close to the closest racing we've ever had. Go watch some old races. Go watch them. We're getting guys who are getting beat by 30 seconds for 3rd place or 2nd place. 30 seconds in 250s. And it's the closest it's ever been? Come on. 30 seconds. That's more than two seconds a lap average or about, right? I mean, maybe they did 18 laps here or 17. I didn't, I didn't look. But maybe 19, right? But it's a lot. It's a big gap. And is it, it's interesting to me that we come into our sport and say, ah, oh, it's just a, it's the most competitive ever. But it, 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 is it? I don't know. We always see the same thing every single year where we, ah, oh, we're coming in. We got all this hype. All these guys can win, but, you know, they can't. And I was wrong. Early in the season, I did a pre-race show. I never published it. I thought we'd have seven 450 winners this year. I do not believe that's going to happen. Jason Anderson's clearly cream of the crop. Eli Tomac, clearly cream of the crop. Chase Sexton on an on night, obviously cream of the crop. And I think Malcolm has established himself as probably – third to fourth best. Um, you can throw Barsha in that conversation. Barsha, Barsha's, man. Third to fifth. That's Barsha right now, and it's been his, been his MO for a while now. I don't think Barsha's going to win. I hate to say it. You could rattle off a whole shot, and if Anderson or Tomac are in the zip code within top six or seven on the first lap, I don't think that they're not going to be able to chase him down. Let's move on to the 250s. Is Chad Reed going to be the best Aussie that we've ever seen? Probably. Um, Jet's incredibly talented, and He's charismatic. He's great for our sport in many ways. He's young. So is he good for the sport? Yes, he's great for the sport. Is Jet incredibly talented? Yes, he's incredibly talented. But is he going to be better overall than Chad Reed was? That's a great question. He's clearly better outdoors. No offense to Chad Reed. I don't know if Chad ever really put all of his effort into outdoors. I don't know. I don't know Reedy. And obviously he had to go against the, the GOAT, RC. Nobody beat the GOAT. Nobody, right? Not even James Stewart, who was... The new goat, he couldn't beat RC outdoors. Just wasn't happening. So I don't think you know nobody could. Stefan Efforts, who's incredible, should be should be on people's Mount Rushmore. They don't put him on there, but he should be. Um, he couldn't beat the goat. So and he beat James Stewart, right? He couldn't beat the goat. So at the end of the day, I don't think that Hunter or Jet are going to be better than Chad Reed long term. I think they're great for the sport. I'm glad to see that they're here in the U.S. mixing it up. 
Hunter is an incredibly gifted rider. He's very smooth. He doesn't look like a risk taker. He took a risk in those whoops trying to chase down Christian Craig. He was giving him a good run for his money. I'm really proud of the fact that he put all his nuts on the chopping block in that race and tried to go after Craig. Somebody needs to do it. And he pushed it through the whoops. And he pushed it a little bit beyond his capability. And now he'll get better, right? He'll learn how to do that as, as time. He just needs more whoop experience, more time, more understanding of how to save screw-ups. But that was hurtful. I mean, he's got to be hurt. I don't know how hurt he is, but it looked painful. Um, he's probably hurt, right? And if, he, if he's not majorly hurt, he's beat up and banged up. It hurts your confidence. Luckily for him, he's got some weeks off to kind of heal up if he's going to even pursue the last couple rounds. I mean, why would you? You're not going to win the title. Um, obviously, your sponsor is your team. But that had to be brutal. And then Craig. So here's an interesting question. Craig is almost as fast as the top 450 guys in qualifying. I mean, he's right there. I would be willing to bet on his 250, Craig could top 5 to 7 in the 450 class right now. Easy. Took him 250, 450 class. So where's he going to go for 450s? Who's going to pick him up? Number one, he's a little older. And that's not a negative in my opinion. He looks healthy. He looks trim. He looks fit. Uh, I don't think there's any body injuries there. Obviously, he broke his back when he was younger. But I think he's over that. So I think that uh, he's healthy. It's not a, a matter of wanting to hire a guy because he's not healthy. To start keep him? If you're Yamaha, why would you want to let him go, Right. Um, but then do you keep three 450 guys? I don't know. Why would you keep three 450 guys? Now you're going to have an interesting dynamic where Tomac, let's assume that he's going to continue to be good. You have Ferrandez, who we know will be good outdoors, and he's been fast indoors. He just hasn't quite gotten the starts. I mean, I don't think you could get worse starts than Dylan Ferrandez. And I would have said you couldn't have gotten worse starts than Dylan Ferrandez until I watched his heat race start where he crashed. That's even worse than his starts have been this year. But, man, uh, what do you do with Craig? And then if you're one of these third – not third level, if you're one of these second tier teams, can you get a Craig? Will he go to you? Right? Like you could be a Rocky Mountain ATV who has a great bike, a great team, and there's going to be a plethora of riders available here pretty soon. Do you get a guy like a Craig? What about Colt Nichols? Where do they end up? Do they go to a lower level team? I don't know. That's interesting to me. We're assuming Craig wins. Frankly, I think he's going to win. He could go out there and get fifth places for the rest of the season. He's going to win. If he's smart, he'll know that. I don't think he did the smartest move with Freeze. I think passing Freeze around the outside is a risky proposition for anybody, let alone when it's a first lap and you're right there and you're the fastest guy. So we can blame Freeze all we want. I think that was stupid on Christian's part. Pass him up the inside. Knock his blocks off. But don't go around the outside of him. Just don't do it. It's not that complicated. Like, duh. And I know, I'm just talking here. I'm just talking. This will never get seen by these guys. But, I mean, really, you know what he does. Don't go around the outside of him. Ever. Ever. Don't line up outside of him on the start. Never. It's Vince Freeze. He wins this title, just goes out there, does the best he can do, which we know he can win. He's the fastest guy. He's going to go, I think, 450 outdoors. He'll probably do well. He's always done well on the 450. I don't know where he ends up. Uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to be pretty soon here to East Coast. So um, we got Vince Freeze moving to 450s. I'm curious how he'll do. We got Oldenburg moving to 250s. I've heard a birdie has told me that Oldenburg is fast, really fast. So we're going to see how that shakes up. Um, hopefully his confidence is good. The bike's clearly good. So we got a dirt change. We got a venue change. We got a temperature change, travel change, time zone changes. I'm excited. I have to stay up till 12 o'clock to watch these races super excited about that we got arlington coming up i'll be at arlington so you can try and come find me if you want to come find me i'll be around uh some of me and my guys some of our crew will be hanging out up there so tell me what you think leave a comment uh, if you want to help support the channel go to hpracedevelopment.com you can buy some merch like this t-shirt it's a pretty cool shirt. I wear this casually. As you can see, it's a Sunday. This is what I wear out. This is my form of dress clothing. It's got a nice setup on the back, which I'm not going to show you. So it's pretty cool. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, subscribe. We're going to do a lot of cool, cool, cool stuff coming up on the channel with the dyno testing and the shop and all the stuff that we do there. Plus, I'm going to be doing our Sunday grind with coffee and dirt bikes, post-race analysis every Sunday. It's going to be coming at you, so make sure you come on and follow along. We're going to add some people into the show, see if I can get some privateers on the show. I just got to figure out how to do the technology with the Zoom and the FaceTime and all the stuff that we got to do to make that happen. First sip of coffee in the show. So good once it hits your lips. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on the Sunday Grind.